Good afternoon from New York, good morning or good evening wherever you find yourself today. Welcome to this virtual event to mark Human Rights Day 2020. My name is Craig Mokhyber, Director of the Human Rights Office here at United Nations Headquarters in New York. Over the course of the next 45 minutes, we will be celebrating the COVID-19 frontline heroes, those who have borne the brunt of this pandemic as they work to help those around them. The people who at personal risk and hardship made it possible for us to be fed, provided medical care and kept safe. In other words, the people who made our human rights possible. We'll be hearing from people in the health sector, education, women's support networks, mask making and the world of music all telling their own stories. But first, a few words about the reasons for this event. The daily actions of our COVID-19 frontline heroes help achieve the rights of others. But our heroes also have rights themselves, rights that have not always been respected during this crisis. Around the globe, the Human Rights Day this year centers on the need to recover better, harnessing the power of global and community solidarity and underscoring our interconnectedness and our shared humanity. Human rights must be central to efforts to build forward in the wake of this pandemic. And we will reach our common goals, but only if we are able to create opportunities that are equal for all, address the failures exposed and exploited by COVID-19, and apply a human rights approach to tackle entrenched, systemic, and intergenerational inequalities, as well as exclusion and discrimination. It is precisely this vision that underpins the call to action for human rights that was launched earlier this year by United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. In it, he recommitted the United Nations system to place human rights at the center of everything we do. And with those words, I will now hand over to the Secretary General, who will make some opening remarks. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced two fundamental truths about human rights. First, human rights violations harm us all. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on vulnerable groups, including frontline workers, people with disabilities, older people, women and girls, and minorities. It has thrived because poverty, inequality, discrimination, the destruction of our natural environment and other human rights failures have created enormous fragilities in our societies. At the same time, the pandemic is undermining human rights by providing a pretext for heavy-handed security responses and repressive measures that curtail civic space and media freedom. The second truth highlighted by the pandemic is that human rights are universal and protect us all. An effective response to the pandemic must be based on solidarity and cooperation. Divisive approaches, authoritarianism and nationalism make no sense against the global threat. People and their rights must be front and center of response and recovery. We need universal rights-based frameworks like health coverage for all to beat this pandemic and protect us for the future. My call to action for human rights spells out the central role of human rights in crisis response, gender equality, public participation, climate justice, and sustainable development. On Human Rights Day and every day, let's resolve to act collectively with human rights front and center to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and build a better future for all. As the Secretary General rightly says, human rights must be at the top of the agenda and without fail not least if we want to recover in a way that makes the world more equal, more just, and better for all. Delivering on the promise of human rights at the local level is an essential means to achieving those goals during and beyond the pandemic era. An important example of local level action is offered by our partners at the New York City Commission on Human Rights, which enforces the city's human rights law and educates the public about it. It's now a pleasure to welcome Carmelin Malalis, its chair and commissioner. Hi, my name is Carmelin P. Malalis. As chair and commissioner of the New York City Commission on Human Rights, I share in the United Nations recognition of the frontline heroes of the coronavirus pandemic. You are the backbone of our communities around the world, and the New York City Commission on Human Rights thanks you. 
The Commission enforces the most comprehensive local civil and human rights laws in the United States. COVID-19 has tested the strength of our law and our ability to answer to the unprecedented ways the pandemic hurts workers, businesses, and tenants. Though we have seen over 500 reports of discrimination related to COVID-19, I am proud that we have not faltered in protecting New Yorkers. In the United States, Asians, despite so many being frontline workers, have been scapegoats for the pandemic. Asian people have faced harassment and even violence reminiscent of other times of crisis. So we took action. Together with our public artist in residence, Amanda Pingbody Bakia, we led a public awareness campaign called I Still Believe in Our City. The campaign conveys the love, respect, and gratitude New Yorkers feel towards frontline workers who have not given up in this fight. We will not give up either. We are confronting this pandemic as a global family. If you face discrimination because you are a frontline worker here in New York City, know that the commission has your back. If your landlord tries to evict you because they think you are a risk to other tenants, the commission has your back. We are standing up for one another in extraordinary ways. We will fight for you as you have fought for us. Thank you. Our thanks to the commissioner for those words and for the important work that the commission does throughout this difficult period. Now, let's hear from more of our COVID-19 frontline heroes. For many people, the frontline of the pandemic evokes images of the health workers who have stepped up repeatedly and tirelessly all around the world. Not only in intensive care units and emergency rooms of hospitals and clinics, but also in the communities of which they are a part. Community health care is critical to ensuring that no one is left behind during the pandemic, as well as uh, in the period during which we will try to recover better from this. And let's face it, women are the cornerstones of such care. In Thailand, the more than 800,000 women health volunteers account for 84% of health workers across the nation. Let's hear the story of just a few of them. Women health volunteers are helping to break the stereotype that the role of women in society is limited at home, families and domestic space. But it is quite obvious that the health volunteer sector is dominated by women. I think women can take meaningful roles in pandemic prevention for the whole community and for the country. เราก็ยอมเสียสละโดยการว่าออกไปตรวจสุขภาพที่บ้านเอาผลผลของคนไข้เนี่ยเอามาให้หมอเพื่อหมอเนี่ยจะได้จ่ายยาแล้วเราก
อย่างน้อยเนี่ยในชุมชนเนี่ยเราก็ได้แบ่งเบาภาระหน้าที่ของเขาได้บางอย่างในหน้าที่ที่เราสามารถทําได้Focusing on the rights of communities, their right to health and other human rights, is of paramount importance now and will remain so during and after the recovery, particularly those communities that have been among the hardest hit. The pandemic has placed major strains on indigenous peoples, including by disrupting culturally important social connections, but it has also underlined the resilience of these communities. We will now hear from Margarita Hernandez from Guatemala. She is what is known as an abuela camadrona, or a grandmother midwife. She belongs to the Mayan Chusigan community close to Santa Cruz del Quiche. Camadronas are not only midwives but also leaders and advisors and guides for their communities. To be a camadrona is a gift and it is a calling. Margarita is a member of the Council of Midwives in the Department of Quiche. She will now explain how the midwives continue to ensure access. For indigenous women to traditional ways of childbirth, despite the challenges posed by the pandemic. Doña Margarita, entonces voy a hacer las preguntas en el contexto del COVID-19. ¿Qué significó en su trabajo como abuela comadrona? Bueno, de este que el momento que tan difícil, verdad? Yo la gente más me buscaba. La gente ya no quieren ir al hospital, tiene miedo porque ahí está el contagio, entonces ya no se quiere ir. Todas las personas, de las mujeres ladinas, nacieron sus bebés en la casa, les atendí en la casa, nacieron los niños. Casi todos los el tiempo que durante el tiempo que llevamos ahorita con esta enfermedad, todo en la casa se están aliviando mis enfermos. Lo que yo me me costó mucho y sufrí bastante cuando el tiempo que ya no hay bus, ya no hay tuk tuk, ya no hay ya no hay nada, camioneta, nada. Tuve que caminar yo a dos horas, hora y media, me ha costado demasiado. Ese es lo que me pasó el, durante el tiempo que estamos delicados, el tiempo. Ahorita ya no, pues, porque ya hay carro, pero sí, mi gente no se anima a ir al hospital. Eso es mi, mi trabajo, lo que yo hice durante ese tiempo tan difícil, pero ahí estuve trabajando y gracias a Dios que yo me siento todo bien. Todo el tiempo estoy trabajando, estoy saliendo, no, no, me, no me cerré. Estoy caminando, estoy trabajando con la gente y sigo trabajando. ¿Y la protección para la prevención personal para la enfermedad? Pues lo que yo hacía, mi mascarilla, mi gel, mi spray, cuando yo, por el momento pues eso estoy usando ahorita también, mi mascarilla y mi gel, mis manos no me hace falta, mi jabón líquido para lavar mi mano y siempre mis guantes. Yo siempre uso guantes cuando yo trabajo con las mujeres, siempre con mis guantes. Y mi spray cuando suben los buses o en tuk tuk le voy a echar el spray y me siento ahí. ¿Eso es el ministerio? No, yo compré de una vez. Soy yo lo que compré porque el centro de salud no habló nada, 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 no ayudó nada, ni guante, ni nada, no nos dio nada, no nos dio nada. Eh, no sé si eso es, no sé lo que entonces solito yo compré mis cosas, yo todas mis cosas que estoy usando solito estoy comprando. No tuvo problema con los cocodes, con la policía, con no, ahí sí, ahí sí, yo estuve trabajando desde el tiempo, el toque de queda, porque, porque yo fui a sacar mi seguro en el centro de salud, si ellos me dieron, yo, yo puedo trabajar cualquier hora, yo salí, incluye, esto, los policías me llegan a traer en la casa cuando voy a ir a atender los partos. Muchas gracias, señora Margarita. Well, there you have it. Margarita is dedicated to helping mothers bring new lives into the world, but the entire life cycle has been hit by this pandemic. It's no secret that the pandemic has hit older generations particularly hard, notably those living in care homes. Lockdown measures taken for solid public health reasons have also disrupted their ties with the outside world. In Poland, Marina Julia is part of a non-governmental organization that works with a range of disadvantaged groups, the homeless, prisoners, as well as refugees and older persons. In the face of the COVID-19 crisis, she has brought these groups together to help them to cope and to build new connections between people. Czasach zarazy jestem na pierwszej linii frontu, ale nie walczę, łączę. 
Jestem wolontariuszką między innymi w domu, który nazywam Domem Samotnej Starości. Są tam babcie, polskie babcie, opuszczone, zapomniane, nieodwiedzane. I w czasach zarazy nie wolno ich zostawić, nie możemy dotknąć, nie możemy przytulić, nie możemy pogłaskać pomarszczone starcze ręce, ale możemy zobaczyć się przez szybę, możemy wyszeptać kocham Cię, możemy dla nich zatańczyć. Będziemy śpiewać, będziemy tańczyć, będziemy bąchać pomarańcze. A w ośrodkach dla uchodźców mieszkają kobiety. Czeczeńskie kobiety. Te kobiety w większości nie mają mam, bo albo zostały w Czeczeni, albo umarły, albo zginęły w dwóch krwawych wojnach. Więc cóż może być piękniejszego, jak dać polskiej babci czeczeńską córeczkę, czeczeńskiego wnuczka? Jestem w zdjęcie, że w Polsce znalazłam drugą mamę, a moje dzieci babcią. Tańczę dla mojej polskie babcie. Ja też. Well, music and dance have brought cheer to older persons in the Polish care homes visited by Marina Julia, thanks to her young friends from the refugee community. Whether amateur or professional, the arts have the power to unite people in times of crisis. But this sector relies on public performances, so it's been turned upside down by the pandemic. Many performers have had to rethink their operations from A to Z after losing the ability to make money and to fund their work, making this a pivotal moment. To try to remedy this, non-governmental organizations have sprung up to help artists navigate the impacts of the crisis and to recover better, for example, by writing inequities in streaming royalties. These include the New York-based Curio Arts, thanks to whom we can now enjoy a performance from Christian DeMarco of Dark Sky Hustlers. Playing at a safe distance in the open air of Central Park is his way of showing us, through music, what he's doing to build morale during the pandemic. I would like to introduce one of our favorite New York City bands, Dark Sky Hustlers. I ran into Christian at Central Park playing solo guitar and asked him if I might share Dark Sky's music with you today.
Our thanks for that. Well, music and design are part of the same family, the arts. In the face of the severe economic challenges posed by the pandemic, designers have pivoted into new areas. One of the most visible is making masks. Colorful designs enable wearers to express themselves, to add a bit of beauty to the world in difficult times, but also to protect their health and the health of those around them. In Spain, Musa Pogban has joined hands with an organization distributing food to those in need, using the same network to get masks to them too. Normally, my profession is to do a flamenca, camisa, a little bit of the costura, no? But this year, lo que hace falta ahora son las mascarillas y para ayudar a la gente que lo hace falta. Me llamo Musa Pogba, Yo soy de Costa de Mafi. Voy llevo aquí en Córdoba, voy hace ya casi tres años. ¿Qué pasa? ¿Cómo estás? Córdoba es la ciudad más bonita de España. En el momento de confinamiento, la gente necesita mascarilla. Hay algunos que no tienen dinero para comprarla. Hay algunos que no saben cómo conseguirla. Entonces hemos puesto en contacto con la asociación Heredia porque colaboramos juntos y a través de gente también puede conocer a nuestra asociación, los mafiliños aquí en Córdoba. Estamos aquí también para echar cable a los demás que le hace falta también. En el filito, ¿no? En el filito. En el confinamiento me llamó Bacari y me dijo que Musa, un compañero que cosía y que estaba haciendo muchas mascarillas, pero que no sabía dónde podía repartirlas. Y nosotros, pues, durante la pandemia estábamos dando alimentos a nuestra familia. Entonces le dijimos que nos vendría genial repartirlas, lo mismo que los alimentos, las mascarillas. Entonces vino y nos hizo la entrega de muchísimas mascarillas que tuvimos para darle a todas las familias. Y la verdad que nos encantó el detalle y las familias también muy contentas. Como siempre, trabaja divinamente, qué bien lo hace. Esta situación que estamos viviendo ahora, entre nosotros podemos ayudarnos porque somos iguales. Europa, África, somos iguales. Somos hermanos, somos hermanas. Que se apoyan entre nosotros para poder salir de esto. Si yo traigo mi ayuda, tú tienes que traer tu parte también. Entre nosotros colaboramos juntos. Well, as Musa says, we are all equal. Yet the pandemic has thrown the spotlight on specific threats to the human rights of some parts of society, not least women. Sexual and gender-based violence has grown alarmingly during the crisis. In Nigeria, Joy Ngozi Azelo was already working to stem it before the pandemic struck. And her organization has used its existing networks and methods to raise public awareness about how to tackle COVID-19, with messages in different local languages on radio stations and social media, and hands-on activities in communities. One of the things I, I was concerned was my immediate constituency and their safety and their understanding about this COVID, what measures, and how they have to keep clean, wash their hands regularly. Because people are like, how do you even people didn't have basic knowledge on how to do it? We all that hand sanitizer, we went to primary health care facilities, we went, we produced, we had buckets, we, we, we had information uh, that could explain wash your hand, we had bucket with a tap, we, we had to distribute it across our immediate constituency. Women inclusion, uh, even though it's a matter of right and social justice that they should be involved, and UN Resolution 13, uh, 25 that we're celebrating the 20th uh, anniversary this year, said women must be on the table. Whether you're talking about peace, whether you're talking about pandemic or issues of, uh, of this nature, they have to be there. We still need to raise an army of women, especially young girls, who will, their voices, we can amplify their voices to continue not only the safety messages, but also to keep them safe. Well, undeniably, empowering women is vital to achieving all human rights. Amid the pandemic, they frequently have found themselves playing additional roles, as the family doctors who monitor the health conditions of family members, protect them from infection, and care for them in ways that are complicated by lockdowns. In essence, women have become first responders, directly responsible for protecting family members and thus 
contributing to the whole of society's fight against COVID-19. This is what underpins the work of Entisar El Said of the Cairo Foundation for Development and Law in Egypt. مع مطلع شهر فبراير 2020 بدأت أزمة جائحة كوفيد 19 تظهر في مصر بحلول شهر مارس ابتدت الحكومة المصرية في اتخاذ عدد من التدابير والإجراءات الاحترازية لمواجهة الوباء في ظل تأكيد الحكومة على ضرورة هذه الإجراءات لحماية المواطنين والمواطنات اتخذت عدد من, من الإجراءات كان ليها أثار اجتماعية واقتصادية على حياة السواد الأعظم من المواطنين والمواطنات خاصة الفئات الأقل دخلا في المجتمع المصري إحنا في مؤسسة القاهرة للتنمية والقانون لقينا أنه في مسؤولية مجتمعية علينا باعتبارنا جزء من هذا المجتمع وباعتبارنا مدافعين عن حقوق النساء في المجتمع المصري خاصة وأنه النساء وفقا للثقافة المجتمعية السائدة في المجتمع المصري بيلعبوا دور نمطي شديد جدا ومع زيادة معدلات العنف ضدهم في ظل بقائهم لساعات أطول داخل المنازل وفي ظل أنه هم كمان مسؤولات عن الرعاية الصحية لأفراد أسرهم في ظل الإصابة بالوباء وخاصة أن هم بيشكلوا جزء كبير من الفئة الخاصة بالعمالة غير المنتظمة فتأثرت حياتهم على المستوى الاجتماعي وعلى المستوى الاقتصادي قررنا أن احنا نطلق خط ساخن مع بداية الأزمة خاص بالدعم النفسي للناجيات من العنف أثناء الأزمات أكدنا من خلال السوشيال ميديا أن احنا ما زلنا مستمرين في تقديم المساعدات القانونية الخاصة بنا كان الهوتلاين شغال طول الوقت وبعض الحالات اللي كانت بتستدعي إجراءات عاجلة من النزول لأقسام الشرطة كان فريق المحامين الخاص بنا موجود وياهم طول الوقت في أقسام الشرطة أصدرنا مجموعة من الأوراق فيها توصيات بكيفية التعامل مع الأزمة لبعض الفئات اللي عملها بيحتم عليها الوجود في أماكن عالية الخطورة للإصابة بالعدوى من المرض زي العاملين والعاملات في الصحافة والإعلام المقدمي ومقدمات الخدمات الطبية المحاميات والمحامين وهكذا قمنا بمبادرة كان الهدف منها توزيع أدوات الحماية والوقاية على الفرق الطبية الموجودة داخل مستشفيات العزل في الحي اللي بنتواجد به كمؤسسة أو الموجود في مقر المؤسسة Well, the pandemic has also caused massive disruption in the education system, with millions of children out of school completely or unable to adequately follow their lessons in the ways that they need to. There's been plenty of innovation, for example, to shift to online classes. But what about places where digital access is a challenge or unavailable altogether? How can the right to education be protected in these circumstances? Our final COVID-19 frontline hero has an answer. Tanika McCoy Phipps is a teacher in Jamaica, and I'm sure you will find her simple solution quite inspirational. So much so, in fact, that it's being spread worldwide by our partners at UNICEF. One day I was just around the back of my yard doing some chores and I heard a lot of noise. And I went to my gate to look to see what it was and I saw children running up and down wild. A lot of kids, some riding bicycles, others playing different games. And I was like, wow, and this was school time. I know that if it wasn't the COVID, they would have been in class. So as a teacher, I took responsibility. I felt responsible because I was like, because we're not able to be with them, they're out there doing that and I felt sad, and I knew that I had to do something about it. Then the thought came to me, paint blackboards in this community, put up the work at a designated spot, 
and let parents know so everybody can just come and access it. Take their phone, take picture and take it back in inside their, their home for their children. And that's what I did. Early every morning, Mrs. McCoy Phipps and her assistants go to different communities where they religiously write the day's lesson on the community blackboard. The devout teacher says the COVID-19 pandemic has only increased her resolve to reach as many students as possible. It's called for teachers to be critical thinkers and proactive. And I can't let my children um, down. It doesn't matter if they're not members of my class. I just know definitely that I am responsible for the nation's children, so I'll have to do something about it. Behind every zinc fence and board lies a lot of children with great potential and ability. A project like this is important because it represents a community response to a community-based problem that has nationwide implications. And she's impacting hundreds of children with this simple idea. Education is a human right. We all have a right to a quality education. These blackboards are ways to help ensure at least some access to the content for the children so that at least every day they have something structured happening. She's working with the parents and the community to make sure that the teaching and learning doesn't stop and we applaud her for that. Equal access to education. You don't know where these great children are. You just have to make sure that nobody's left behind, hold their hands and bring them. Every child can learn, every child must learn. Well, with that, I want to thank you for being with us to mark Human Rights Day 2020. The voices from the ground that we've been able to share with you are a clear illustration that people have stepped up to tackle the pandemic in a way that supports the human rights of everyone. This is a conversation that will and must continue as we strive collectively to recover better. To conclude, I'll now give the closing words to Ilza Brands Karras, the United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights. And I thank you. It gives me great pleasure to close this Human Rights Day event of the New York Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. First of all, I wish to pay tribute to the women and men who have shared their stories with us today. They represent the millions of people on the front line around the world who, despite great personal risk, have defied the COVID-19 pandemic to serve their communities. They have helped safeguard fundamental rights when the world needed it the most. The right to an education, the right to health, the right to safety and personal integrity, and the right to freedom from violence. Through individual courage and personal commitment, those on the front line have helped uphold the dignity of their neighbors and fellow citizens and keep our societies together in times of crisis. As their stories illustrate, this is happening in all corners of the world, from Bangkok to New York City, from Poland to Jamaica, from Cordoba to Cairo. The message that these local voices convey is a global one. The pandemic can only be defeated if we work together and act in solidarity with each other. Those most vulnerable on the margins of society who have already been hardest hit from inequalities and discrimination must be our priority. As the Secretary General underlined at the outset, human rights must be front and center of response and recovery if we are to beat COVID-19 and build forward better. This is also the tenet of the Secretary General's call to action for human rights. Human rights must be at the heart of everything that the United Nations does. With the call to action as our common framework, our office and the entire UN system is committed to continue working hand in hand with governments, local authorities and institutions such as the New York City Commission on Human Rights and civil society to combat the pandemic with human rights. Thank you.